Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see you guys again uh, today. In preparing for my lesson, I was reminded that years ago on uh, The Gong Show, which was a TV show way back when, there was a bodybuilder and he came out on the stage and he had a big muscular body and he did all the bodybuilder poses. He didn't get gonged. And afterwards, the judges were talking to him and the host of the show, Chuck Berry, asked him, what are all those muscles for? And without answering, the bodybuilder began to flex again and pose and the crowd cheered. And then a second time, he asked, yeah, but what do you do with all those muscles? And again, the bodybuilder flexed his muscles and the crowd went crazy. Why? Why did he pose? How come he didn't answer the question? Because he didn't have an answer to the question. The man was all power and he had no purpose other than just to show his muscles off. But for something to have meaning, then it should have purpose. And today people are asking about the meaning of life and they search for it in religion. We search for it in the accumulation of wealth or the accumulation of possessions. And most of us, I think as Christians, when we become a Christian, we probably start off with a sense of purpose. But along the way, I think our life gets cluttered up with meaningless things. We pursue other distractions and those priorities overshadow the meaning of life. It gets lost in all the mix. So what is it? What is the meaning of life. How would I answer the question for me to live is what? What does it mean to live? What does it mean to have a life that has purpose and meaning? How do I live a life that matters? Well, Paul says in the book of Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So for Paul, living a life that matters meant living a life that mirrored the life of Jesus. It meant being a Christian. It meant living a life that was Christ-like. But I suppose then that would raise the question, well then how did Jesus live? What were his qualities? What were his characteristics? I wanna stay in the book of Philippians today and uh, continue to look at Paul's writings. In Philippians chapter two, Paul writes about wanting to be the same as Jesus having the same mind and the same love. Let's see what he says in chapter two, verse one. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So what does Paul say? I mean, if you were gonna summarize this, you would say that Paul says that Jesus lived a humble life. And we have a weird uh, attitude, I think, when it comes to humility, don't we? We think that humility is putting ourselves down, that a humble person looks down at their shoes, that a humble person speaks with a soft voice, a humble person isn't direct, a humble person isn't successful, a humble person can't be a leader. But where do we get all that definition? I mean, it's certainly not in the Bible. No, the Bible says humility is when you put others above yourself. The Bible says that humility is when you consider the needs of others. But just try publishing that in a best-selling book or try marketing that trait at a leadership conference. Humility is not an idea that gets marketed well in this day and age. Humility and meekness are not what you would call desirable character traits. Our culture worships success and power and ambition and fame and wealth. In fact, back in 1996, a man named William Bennett edited an enormous book 
called the Book of Virtues. And then in the table of contents, he listed a lot of desirable virtues like discipline, responsibility, work, perseverance, loyalty, courage, faith, honesty, compassion, and friendship. Humility didn't even make the list. But Paul adds that to his list of greatness in Colossians 3. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. If you are responsible for hiring new employees, are you gonna hire an employee who's humble? Do you list humility as a character trait on your resume? Would your online dating profile say that you were looking for a spouse who was humble? Humility gets a bad rap because the image that it conjures in our mind is that of a wimp, not the types of people that we would look up to. Humility makes us think of people that get walked on, people that get pushed around, but that's not a biblical definition of humility. In fact, if we look closely at this passage in Philippians, it says exactly what humility should look like. It says to count others more significant than yourselves. Who is that? Who is more significant than you? Who have you treated as more significant than you this morning? You know, we just finished a series where we were taken by the hand to come and see Jesus. But when we looked at Jesus, we, we saw a person that wasn't necessarily a Christian. Jesus doesn't look like a Christian. Right? How would you describe Jesus? Would you describe Jesus as somebody who dressed nice and went to church? Would you describe Jesus as somebody who didn't smoke or drink or swear? No. Paul says, no, Jesus was a humble person. He put others above himself. And at Easter and Good Friday, we looked at the cross. So even that moment, even Jesus' death was a humble action. Jesus died for us. Paul says in verse 5, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Paul says when Jesus was here on earth, he didn't pursue fame. He didn't pursue wealth. He didn't pursue success. Those weren't the things that he reached for. In fact, Paul reminds us that Jesus was humble but he wasn't less. He wasn't lesser than God. He wasn't less powerful than God. Verse five and six says he's equal to God. And yet his visit to earth wasn't about exploiting that or throwing his weight around. Verse seven says, but Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. If I said, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a man who is humble. His life can't be wrapped up in just saying, well, he was a guy that had long hair and wore sandals and he uh, liked to carry sheep on his shoulders. Even Jesus describes himself in Matthew 20. He says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let's not play this down. Let's not be casual about this, okay? Jesus was God, and he came here, and he humbled himself. Jesus is God, and he came here to serve us. If last week we said that living a life that matters meant living a life that put Christ first, then we must also live as Christ by adopting a life of service, and humility. But that's super tough. How do we counter all those natural tendencies in us that we have to compete with one another? How do we move past our our natural inclination to be selfish, to be boastful, to be prideful, to be braggarts, to be show-offs? I think it's all right here in Philippians once again. Paul says in verse 3, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. You heard it right here first, folks, because 
you are not going to hear that message anywhere else in the world. When you ask an athlete how they became so good, or you see an actor on a talk show and you ask him how he got his career to the silver screen, when you ask a billionaire how they got rich, you ask a politician how they came to power, not one of them will tell you that it was by counting others more significant than yourselves. This is not the advice you'll get at a seminar. This is not the advice you'll get from a TED Talk. In this world, if you want to succeed, if you want to get rich, then you have to live a self-centered life and you have to put yourself first. But today I'm not talking to you about gaining wealth. I'm not talking to you about popularity. We're talking about living a life that matters. Living a life that has meaning. And I tell you, some of you have already tapped out. You stop listening. You've already decided this isn't for you. You could say, yeah, but you don't understand the world I live in, Pastor David. Uh, it's, it's kill or be killed out there, and I can't afford to put other people first. Not, not, not where I live, not in my line of work. And I get it. I mean, the whole Christianity thing of being like Jesus, it throws a big damper on a lot of what we consider normal in a modern day life. And it's hard to be a Christian, especially when you start talking about Philippians chapter two in a serious and practical way. The world we live in is competitive, even among Christians, even among churches. I mean, think about it. Many Christians tend to think that my goal is to be a better Christian, better than other Christians, so that they look at me and I'm admired. I want to be known as the best teacher, the guy that always raises his hands, the lady that, got, that has all the answers. I want to be the people that they come to for advice. How come they went to that guy for advice? I know more about the Bible than that person. I want to be known as the best giver. I, I have the best praying prayers, <laughs> right? We want all the praise. But why would we think that? Why would we think that's the goal of, uh, of what a Christian should be? As Christians, we're called to be like Christ. And, and we certainly don't ever see Jesus do any of those things. In fact, he spoke against it. Jesus says in Matthew 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And he continues this exact same thought in Matthew 23. Talking about the religious leaders, he say they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus says the essence of humility that others are just as valuable as you are, whether it's their lives, their time, their investments, their lives are just as worthy as yours. And in fact, in talking about living a life like Christ, what do you think is the most Christ-like character that we could adopt? What's the most Christ-like character that we could emulate? Love? Patience, kindness, self-control. Hey, those are all good ones. They are. Those are all great. And they're even traits that Jesus would use to describe himself. But listen to Jesus in his own words. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am what? Gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says of himself that he is gentle and lowly in heart, unselfish, humble. The last person he thought of was himself. Jesus thought of everyone else as worth dying for. Paul says he put himself below everyone else. 
Paul writes, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Yeah. And guess what, Pastor David? He got killed. <laughs> he got pushed around. Acting like Jesus will get you killed. Yep. It probably will. But Jesus didn't ask us to pick up our toys and follow him. He didn't ask us to pick up ourself and follow him. He said, pick up your cross. And what was Jesus' reward for his humility? Philippians 2, verse 9 says, Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Jesus is the greatest example of humility and selflessness. But considering others better than yourself does not mean that you somehow have to play a trick on your brain so that you somehow force yourself to believe that you're inferior to everybody else. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't tell himself that every sinner in the world was superior to him. On the contrary, he was the pure and spotless, sinless Lamb of God, right? He is the Son of God. The, the scriptures say that he is equal with God the Father, and yet Jesus lived a life that showed that even the most powerful, see, that's the key, even the most powerful can be humble. Even a leader of thousands can be humble. Jesus tells a parable about humility in Luke chapter 18. The Bible says, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week I give tithes of all I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. How could the Pharisee have been humble in this situation? You know, just taking a step back, look at the real world, see how the real world works, maybe taken a couple of seconds and been honest, right? I mean, in, instead of saying, oh, thank God I'm not a scumbag, right? Instead of saying that, what he should have said is, if that person over there had had all of God's blessings, he probably would be a better person than me. And if I had all the neglect and trial and handicaps that he had, I would probably be the worst of rebels and I would probably be living a godless life. See, pride is self-centeredness, but it's also a life that takes credit for who you are. Instead of living a life just the opposite, a life that gives credit to God for all the grace and blessings that he gives us. Luke chapter 19 says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I am a stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. See, Jesus treated people with worth, with value. And when he saw Zacchaeus, he didn't say, Zacchaeus, you're a disgrace. You're a dummy. Zacchaeus, you're a real loser. You're a terrible, stupid, weak, person. Is that how Jesus talked? Would you respect anyone who talked like that? 
Would you follow anyone who talked like that? But the crowd is thinking it, right? The people in the crowd said, why on earth would he go to that guy's house? No, instead, Jesus imparts dignity. And he says, Zacchaeus, you know what? I have no place to invite you to, but you can invite me to your house for dinner. I would love to be your guest. Nobody would dream of making Zacchaeus their host. But Jesus did. And that's humility. Jesus treated him like a valued person. And in so doing, Zacchaeus repented of all his ways, and he chose to become an honest man. Jesus never treated anyone as being inferior. He treated sinners as people worthy of his friendship. Children were welcome to him. Women were treated with respect and compassion. Tax collectors and rebels were called to follow him. He even ate with Pharisees. There was not a proud or prejudiced bone in his body. Jesus loved all people and he treated them with dignity. Jesus took an interest in every person who crossed his path. He never asked if it was politically correct to associate with a tax collector. He never asked if it was culturally uh, correct to associate with a Samaritan woman. He never asked if it was ethically correct to associate with Pharisees. He never asked if it was morally correct to associate with fallen women. He never asked if it was socially correct to associate with lepers. He never asked if it was intellectually cor correct to associate with children. You know why he didn't ask those questions? Because he didn't care. Jesus had none of the pride that leads to discrimination. But in humility, he loved and accepted all people. Paul writes, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul says we need to consider others as better than ourselves. For as soon as we even think we're better than anyone else, we have established a bias for discrimination. If I'm better than everyone else, why should I stoop and associate with them? Why should I help them? Why should I serve them? They should climb up in a, to, to help me. They should associate with me. In fact, smugness and superiority is, is the same kind of pride that keeps Christians and churches from working together. Matthew 7, Jesus reminds us, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? In fact, listen to this great poem. Here's a wonderful poem. It says, when you're criticizing others and finding here and there a fault or two to speak of or a weakness you can tear, when you're blaming someone's meanness or accusing some of pelf, it's time that you went out to take a walk around yourself. There's a lot of human failures in the average of us all and lots of grave shortcomings in the short ones and the tall. But when we think of evils men should lay upon the shelves, it's time we all went and took a walk around ourselves. We need so often in this life the balancing of scales, the seeing in us how much wins and how much in us fails. But before you judge another just to lay him on the shelf, it would be a splendid plan to take a walk around yourself. Look at yourself and ask, do I treat others better than myself? Do I have respect? Do I give other people worth? Do I give other people dignity? Do I take an equal concern in their interests as my own? Every relationship of ours would improve drastically if Paul's words were taken seriously and applied. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Look each of you not to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. There is no school on the planet that can teach you a better solution to life's conflicts. There is no book that you can buy in the self-help section that will more accurately address 
how to get along with other people and make friends. How do you do it? How do you humble yourself? Well, first, I would start with reconciliation. That's always a good place to start. Reconcile with God. Reconcile with each other. Has there been someone in your life that you've been treating as inferior? I think starting with forgiveness is a good place. Or you could even start with forgiving someone else who's wronged you. And then service. This was Jesus's life. Anytime someone asks me, what's the next step in my Christian walk? The next step is always service. Service. Jesus said service was his primary mission. Not to be served, remember, as a selfish person or a self-centered person might want, but to serve. Maybe we need to wash each other's feet, so to speak, metaphorically, symbolically. The significance here of, of washing someone's feet, that it's, the significance isn't the physical act, but it's the posture that it represents. Maybe we need to go and find someone or some group of people that I can genuinely serve. And then lastly, glory. Just make sure that all the glory and all the thanks goes to God. Make sure that God is the one who receives the glory. The humble person recognizes that every blessing is from God, that he equips us, that he empowers us. I don't need thanks. I don't need praise. I don't need glory. I don't need my name written in lights or, or somewhere. I make sure that it all goes to God. I don't want anyone to notice me. In true humility, I want to recognize and make sure that God gets all the glory. Humility is not weakness. Humility is living a life of Christ and others first. Humility is simply recognizing that without Jesus, I am nothing. Right? Without Jesus, I am nothing. He is the source of whatever strength I have. All of that comes from God. And as long as I have breath to breathe, as long as I am here on earth, I am his instrument. I am here to do his will. Do this and you will live a life that matters. Let's pray together. Father God, once again, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know that I'm supposed to live a humble life. I know that I'm supposed to be a humble person. And yet, the world we live in would preach the opposite. The voices that bombard my life each and every day, the images, the culture around me, tells me to compete, to be better, to be faster, to be stronger, to be first. Lord, I want my life to matter. I want my life to make a difference. I want my life to be so much more than just myself. In that, I want to make my life about others and putting them first, finding ways to put you first and others first, to love God and to love others. That is the goal, to be more like Christ. In humility, he put others first. So far that he went to the cross for them. Lord, teach me what it means to take the log out of my own eye. Teach me what it means to wash someone's feet. Teach me what it means to love my enemies. Teach me what it means to love my neighbor as myself. I know these are hard lessons to learn, but I know it's the next step in my faith. And if there's someone who could use my gifts or my talents or my voice, Show me how I might serve them, how I can better help them. Christians all their lives have helped me. It's my turn. It's my turn to pick up the bowl and the towel and to turn and to wash the feet of my neighbor. Help me choose a life of humility, a life more like your son. Amen.
Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for spending some time with us. Of course, this is a YouTube video or you're listening to us as an MP3, as a podcast. Uh, as always, we'd love for you to like this video. You can also subscribe to the channel so that you can stay alerted when we upload a new lesson. Uh, or clip and copy the URL at the top, the address. Post it to your own social media wall to let other people know how you spent your Sunday morning or post it to a friend's wall if you think it might benefit them. I love you guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye.